You're listening to Drug Positive, the risk reduction and benefit enhancement podcast, reducing shame and stigma to save lives and end the drug war. Yeah! Guys, we are so fortunate to have our guest speaker here today. Uh, all of you um, most likely heard about this event through the Utah Psychedelic Society. That's why we're here. Um, and we're very excited to introduce Emmanuel Spherios. Uh, he is the founder of Dance Safe, and he is also the host of Drug Positive Podcast. And uh, he's going to tell us a little bit more about himself. I really quickly, and I am doing this wrong. I should have said this first and then introduced. Um, But we want to make sure that all the events that we have going with Utah Psychedelic Society can be uh, sustainable and you can support us. Um, Today, we are not allowed to collect cash monies because we're at the public library. But what you can do is go to the uh, Eventbrite event that we have going on here and search for Emmanuel Spherios and it's S-F-E-R-I-O-S and then just uh, you know buy a ticket if you haven't already and if you have already but you like to see this type of thing continue please buy another ticket it doesn't mean that you're gonna get this event twice this is a one and done I well no you'll be back I'll bet you anything we love you and so without further ado everyone Emmanuel thank you Thanks for having me. I want to thank the organizers, uh, but I also want to tease them a little bit because they chose a title for this talk that was on the Facebook ad for a while called Free Heroin and how it reduces stigma, and it got some people a little bit annoyed. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, I kind of, you know, take some responsibility for that because I, you know, suggested that they make a provocative title. Um, but it, uh, it's not exactly about like just kind of making heroin free for anyone and everyone. Really what I wanted to talk about was heroin maintenance programs and why they're important for ending the drug war and why reducing the stigma around other drugs besides psychedelics is important for all of us. So I'll, I'll get into that, um, talk a little bit about addiction, what that is. But you know, really what I wanted to talk about was why it's important for the psychedelic community to ally with the rest of the drug policy reform community, and that includes opiate users and their loved ones, family members who uh, are struggling with a loved one with addiction or who have had a loved one die. They are at the forefront of this movement, and they are going to succeed and lead the change more than we are. I like to say the first stage of drug policy reform was the cannabis legalization movement. The second phase is gonna be the opiate moms. They are calling for harm reduction, for decriminalization, et cetera. And this is really important. It's really important for the psychedelic community to know. It is not the cognitive liberty argument that's going to win this battle. It's the harm reduction argument. The reason, the real reason, the reason that's going to motivate all your Mormon friends here in this beautiful city of Salt Lake City, uh, the argument that's going to convince them that we need to decriminalize drugs is not cognitive liberty. It's not, I have a right to put in my body whatever I want, even though that's true. The reason is because when we decriminalize drugs, we save lives. Decriminalization means users are no longer arrested for having on their person drugs for their own personal consumption. It's a first step towards the ultimate goal, which is legal regulation. Legal regulation is better where there are outlets where people can legally purchase drugs, uh, and then we know that they're free of adulterants, they're pure, but decriminalization is a humongous first step. It's like we're 90% of the way there, because once you do that, you open up the public space. People are no longer afraid to talk about their drug use with their parents, with their teachers, with healthcare professionals, with police. They don't use alone. You eliminate the fear of being arrested, and that opens up the conversation. It also opens up spaces for public services to help drug users like harm reduction services. We don't have to hide. Dance Safe would be invited to any uh, event to do drug checking, which we know cleans up and adds quality control to the market. Treatment and other services just expand. And this is exactly what happened in Portugal. 
16 years ago now, they decriminalized all drugs, and within a year they had reduced their overdose rate by 53%. And it did not increase the use of the you know, more addictive drugs. Um, there was a, a uptake in cannabis use and psychedelics, but of course there's probably other reasons for that as well. Uh, they are more widely available now than they've ever been in history. That's probably one reason why you guys formed, right? Like, who has a hard time getting psychedelics here? Nobody. <laughs> so, so, yeah, you know, reducing the stigma around the non-psychedelic drugs. Super, super important. A uh, society is judged. I forget what author said this. A society should be judged on the way it treats its most downtrodden, the homeless, the addicted, and there is an unfortunate human motivation. Uh, when I interviewed Dr. Gabor Mate, who wrote the book In the Realm of the Hungry Ghosts, he told me there is no greater motivator of human behavior than shame. And to reduce our own shame, we project what we don't like about ourselves onto others. And we point the finger, we cast the first stone, as it were, and say, at least I'm not like them. And so we, as the psychedelic community, because I'm a psychedelic user, I'm a drug user, I use a lot of different drugs too. I use cocaine a few times a year, I want to just come out and say that right away, I'm not afraid, I, I don't feel any stigma. I, I actually had a problem with meth in my 20s and I overcame that and I don't use that, I won't use that again. But um, I like stimulants and other drugs too, but generally I'm a psychedelic user. But we as psychedelic users do not want to throw other drug users under the bus in order to raise up our status. That's very, very important. And it can happen even unconsciously. Who's uh, familiar with this new online organization or campaign called Thank You Plant Medicine? Thank You Plant Medicine, right? Well, for one, like, there are psychedelics that are unrelated to plants, but when I asked them in a post, hey, can I write about my positive cocaine experiences, they didn't want me to do that. They're like, well, well, we're only here to talk about the drugs that heal people, right? But, you know, stimulants are, can be extraordinarily beneficial for people. In fact, most drug use is beneficial. Most people who use any drug do not become addicted. We're going to get into addiction uh, really. Let me just say, too, there's a couple topics I want to talk about, and then I'm just going to open it up two questions or you can tell me what you want to talk about. So I want to talk about heroin maintenance programs and I want to talk about addiction and what it really means and um, the importance of allying with the rest of the movement. And then I'll open it up to you guys. But I love this campaign. I love what they're doing. Destigmatizing people who use psychedelics is great. They'll allow you to write about, make your video about LSD or, you know, uh, 2CB or other psychedelics, but they don't want you to talk about cocaine, right? They said no, right? And I think even unconsciously that sends this message, right? It sends this message that our drugs are better, you know? Hey, I am really happy that Denver uh, decriminalized mushrooms, right? But... The strategy of decriminalizing the drugs that we think are safer is going to backfire on, that, on us. The reason it's been so successful with cannabis is because not only has no one ever died from cannabis, but everybody knows people who use cannabis. It is like so immensely popular. Mushrooms are not. It's perceived as a niche drug. We, we can't just use a domino strategy where we try to decriminalize all the, you know, the safer drugs first. W that's actually sending this message that the reason we should decriminalize drug, certain drugs is because they're safer, when really we need to decriminalize heroin, meth, cocaine, and the more dangerous drugs first, because those are the people who are dying. There are 80,000 people died of drug overdoses last year. 80,000 and just less than 10 years ago, it was 20,000 and it remains steady. Everyone knows the reason, fentanyl. Fentanyl has hit the markets and is contaminating not just the opioid markets, but also the cocaine markets. The fastest rising drug-related fatalities happening now are, are cocaine users who are dying from fentanyl-laced cocaine. There's at least 15,000 people a year that are dying from fentanyl laced cocaine. Now, we sell fentanyl testing strips on the DanceSafe website, so if you know anyone that uses cocaine, you have to test your cocaine out and make sure there's not fentanyl in it. This is the crisis that's happening right now. This is why we need to decriminalize drugs immediately and stop arresting people who are just using drugs. 
And this is why we all need to join together and promote the decriminalization of all drugs across the board. It's, a, it's based on a harm reduction argument. So don't get caught up in drug chauvinism, psychedelic chauvinism. There are no drugs that are better than any other drugs. Well, you might like, I like certain drugs more than other drugs, but the truth is the vast majority, at least 85% of people who use any drug, use it non-problematically. These are statistics repeated over and over again in surveys. Have you done X drug within the last year? And 85% of the people that say yes to that question do not have any problem. That includes heroin, that includes crack, the notion that addiction lies in the drug, that if you use the drug, it's gonna hijack your brain and you're gonna become addicted is totally false. Most people have no problems with any drug use. We need to stop judging people who use any drug. And we need to stop judging people, obviously, who do develop problems with drug use, people that have um, problematic drug use. I actually think we don't need to dump the word addiction. There's a big argument going on in the drug policy community right now whether the word addiction is stigmatizing or not. Of course, then you can shorten that to a label and say addict. And I think we should probably not use the word addict. Don't label people based on one aspect of their life, but people who are suffering from addiction or problematic drug use. This is almost entirely unrelated to the drug. And so let's talk about that for a little bit. I brought with me the best book on addiction, in my opinion, published a few years ago by Maya Salovitz called The Unbroken Brain. It's a really dense book uh, that talks about all the factors that go into addiction. And the primary argument is that addiction is not a what the National Institute on Drug Abuse says it is, which is brain changes that occur when you use a drug that hijack the reward pathways in your brain and then somehow lead you to being unable to quit. She says addiction is a learning disorder. It's a developmental disorder. It's not a choice, but it involves choices that someone has made. Addiction usually strikes adolescents, people between 16 and, and 25, and it usually resolves itself if you survive it. Usually resolves itself by the time you hit middle age. What does it mean to say that it's a developmental disorder? Well, you have to look at the sort of factors that are common in most people who suffer addiction. And the number one factor is trauma. Not everyone who suffers a high degree of ACEs, A-C-E, adverse childhood events, is what they call it now. Not everyone who has a high degree of ACEs is an addict, but a high percentage of addicts have suffered a high degree of ACEs during their childhood. And what happens as an adolescent is growing up is they learn to associate drug use with relief from their psychological pain. Drug use can become a learned habit to cope with uh, the pain that you're experiencing. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be from childhood abuse. It could be something that's going on in your life that you don't have any other way to effectively deal with it. When I had my nine month problem with methamphetamine, it was right after my first wife divorced me and I was crushed and I had so much to do, but I would wake up and start crying within 30 seconds and I would use a little bit of meth in the morning and it would take away my grief and it let me get a lot of work done. Then it kind of escalated and uh, eventually I had to leave the city I was living in in order to get away with my, uh, from my dealer and my access to methamphetamine. You know, pretty classic, you know, when you start to feel like you or yourself are unable to stop using, right? I had associated meth with relieving my pain. What I really needed to do, and I did after that, I moved to Savannah, Georgia, and I grieved, and it took, it was a long time. I grieved that what I should have done a year earlier over my, over my divorce. But in a way, addiction is like the placebo effect. The placebo effect works. If you tell somebody that this is going to help you, etc., it even works for physical ailments, right? What's weird is the placebo effect even works when you tell someone that you're just giving them a placebo. They've done studies that have proven this. You know, what's going on there? Really, we do kind of mind fuck ourselves into thinking something's gonna work. And we mind fuck ourselves into thinking that this drug is taking away my pain. It become, the interpretation of the feeling of the drug is more important than the withdrawal symptoms themselves. When 
uh, someone is prescribed high-dose opioids for pain, say they got into a really bad car accident, they could be on high-dose opioids for a year. And it comes time to wean, two weeks, wean off your, you know, 500 milligrams of Oxycontin a day, <laughs> no problem. There's no addiction going on there. You're dependent on the drug. If you don't wean, you're going to feel pretty bad if you quit cold turkey. But there's no addiction. Two weeks is really all it takes to wean uh, no more withdrawal symptoms. But if you are addicted to opioids, you could go to prison for a month or two where you don't have access. Well, you can get drugs in prison, but let's just pretend that you can. You, know, you go through uh, withdrawal symptoms for two weeks, and, uh, and you, but now two months later you get out of prison, the first thing you do is go back and find opioids and start using them again. This shows that addiction has little to do with the chemical hooks as they are, the withdrawal symptoms from different drugs. There's a lot more going on there. So why does it fail to punish someone who has a drug addiction? We know it doesn't work, right? We haven't stopped addiction. We've had this raging drug war going on. Our prisons are being filled. One of the main reasons is that because addiction is largely around inability to self-regulate, punishment actually disrupts the areas of our brain that allow us to self-regulate. That fear and anxiety about being arrested does not help a person manage their life better. If anything, it leads them to seek out more drugs and to learn as best they can how not to get arrested. That's all that we're really doing. We need to, have, we need to support people with substance abuse problems. They need not even so much compassion, they need support and they need respect. And what does that mean? How do you support someone who's using drugs? Well, the first thing that you need to do, that we need to do, that Switzerland has done successfully, is give them access to the drug that they're using, to the pure drug, and help them to manage it. This is what is called HAT, H-A-T, heroin-assisted treatment. It's not so much treatment, though, because there's no pretense that you have to quit. They just, they have clinics in Switzerland where if you can prove that you've been addicted to opioids, heroin mostly, and you uh, have tried, you have to have tried to quit and you can't, then you can join this program where up to three times a day you can come in and you get free heroin. Um, but, you know, in Switzerland they have universal health care, so medications are free. Uh, we could do this in this country even if we don't implement Bernie's uh, Medicare for All plan because even if you had to pay for your heroin at the clinic, it would be cheaper than what you're doing on the street. And what this has done by removing all of the pretense that you have to quit. I mean, they even do this in methadone programs right now. There's still this judgment in medication-assisted treatment in our country where they want you to wean and slowly get off because it's, you know, they, they're, we're still judging these people and we're still judging opioids. But in Switzerland, they took all that away. And this, you can stay in this program as long as you want. But the fascinating result of this is that after three years, over 50% of the people who entered this program decided to wean and quit. And that is an order of magnitude greater than any treatment program we have, whether it's 12-step or, or anything. Only about 5% of people will end up succeeding in treatment programs. What that shows is treatment doesn't work. These are just people who were ready to quit anyway. If you're not ready to quit, treatment's not going to help. If you are ready to quit, just go to Savannah with your friends like I did. Just get away. That's all you need to do. You know, you don't have to pay $100,000 to go to a farm where you can horseback riding. You need to detox. You need to get away. And 5% of the people just with enough support can do that. But when you just take away the judgment and give people their heroin on a daily basis, 50% of them eventually decide to quit. And why is that? That's because they are now able to put food in the fridge for their kids. Imagine that. They don't have to prostitute themselves to get money to pay for their drugs. Nobody knows they're using drugs, because unlike daily meth users, where meth does take a toll on your physical health, 
you can use high dose opioids for the rest of live a long healthy life and no one will ever know it the first opioid addicts as it were were doctors and surgeons who had access to it and they're performing their surgery on you while they were on heroin because i'll go back to the heroin maintenance programs in switzerland remind me to do that if i forget because i'm a little tangent here um oh, now i lost my train of thought <laughs> Uh, what was I just saying? But now, uh, I did not smoke cannabis before I come here. Usually, this only happens when I smoke cannabis. I'm like, what was I talking five minutes ago? All right, I'll remember. I will go back to heroin. Okay. So, the reason that Switzerland implemented heroin maintenance programs was not because they were trying to help people. They didn't expect to see that the people were going to quit. What they were trying to do is shrink the illicit heroin market. And they did that because when you remove all of the addicts, so-called addicts, the people, the daily heroin users, the people who are using 90 plus percent of the heroin. So if you remove them all from the illicit market and you let them get free heroin from clinics, not take home, then dealers go out of business and you see fewer new people getting hooked on heroin. And that was absolutely what happened in Switzerland. Their addiction rates have dropped. So the title was a little deceptive. Free heroin for people who are struggling with it to reduce the heroin supply and make it less available for new people to get addicted to it. Right? That's the, that was the goal of Switzerland, and they succeeded. And there are programs in Germany. There are programs in Canada. But they're not as successful as the programs in Switzerland because few doctors actually want to do it because it's considered to be kind of a you know lower prestige job to work with people who are addicted so even in countries where it's legal to prescribe heroin few doctors actually do it because the whole world is suffering from the scourge of shame and stigma right one of the reasons Switzerland has been able to do it, according to Johan Hari and Chasing the Scream, is because Switzerland is a very homogenous country. And the people who were getting in trouble with heroin looked just like the rest of the people. They were the cousins and the friends, right? Whereas the United States is so diverse, even though we know that the opioid crisis is striking everyone, regardless of race, class, ethnicity, it still can be perceived as something associated with the other. Those people, not us. And we don't want to help those derelicts, those junkies, etc. There are always going to be overdoses, even in any perfect system. But there have been zero overdoses in heroin maintenance programs. Zero fatalities in safe injection facilities. So these are the things that we need to be advocating for, joining forces with the harm reduction community, particularly those people working on this from the angle of saving the lives of opioid users. Um, now if I can only remember what I was gonna say about doctors using heroin, anyway. That might be it. That might be all that I had in my brain when I came here to talk about. I wrote some, hold on, I wrote some notes down. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Got to talk about this. There is a, a social and cultural way. In, in, uh, addiction is a social, psychological, cultural disease. I, I like to compare it to Koro. Does anyone know what Koro is? Koro is a disease in Africa in many African countries that will crop up every now and then where masses of people will believe that their genitals are retreating into their bodies. It's considered a mass hysteria. But because the whole culture there believes it, it's real, right? Real in the sense that people seek treatment, there's all this fear about it. Look up KOR, K-O-R-O. <laughs> the cultural setting that a daily drug user lives in can impact their self-identity and their interpretation of their own drug use such that the phenomenon of addiction is socially culturally created as much as it is a learning disorder where you're using the drug to cope. So 
our condemnation of people who use drugs contributes to the misuse of drugs. And this is what I learned in the very beginning when I started Dance Safe in the rave culture with people who were generally using psychedelics MDMA. The irresponsible use that went on there, and man, did I see a lot of it in 1999 in the Bay Area. And it's gotten so much better now, it really has. It's amazing, Dance Safe has succeeded, right? It's great to see that 20 years later, people are far more responsible, far more moderate in their use. The, what I used to call a drug machismo, where it was usually men who would brag, I took six ecstasy tablets last night, blah, blah, right? Like, the more you take, the, the cooler you are. That stuff has kind of gone away, right? Some of you probably have said that there, right? <laughs> I mean, blasting off on DMT is cool, you know, you can brag about that a little bit, you know, not that much dangerous. Have a sitter always when you're blasting off on DMT or 5-MeO. But, uh, you know, generally speaking, people have gotten more responsible over the last 20 years. And what I learned when I started going to uh, raves, because I, didn't, I was not a raver, I um, didn't even like electronic music. I was a punk uh, growing up. When I started Dance Safe, I kind of begrudgingly put up with the music, and then I came to like it, um, uh, some genres uh, more than others. But in any case, what I realized is that we had to start emphasizing the benefits. We had to talk about the benefits of drugs, educate people first about what's good about them, why they're fun, why they're beneficial, and only then, and if you look at all of our literature, the Dance, the dance Safe postcards, uh, they all talk, they all begin with the benefits. And then there's a section called Be Careful where it talks about the risks, right? The early HIV movement, the sex positive movement, began during the 80s HIV crisis. And the nonprofit field of social marketing began back then where they were trying to change behaviors to improve public health. Social marketing is like utilizing traditional marketing tactics, but instead of trying to get someone to buy your product, you're trying to change their behavior. And they realized they had to use these marketing tactics to change the behavior. If they just said, if you have unprotected sex, you could die, it wasn't gonna do very well, right? They had to make using condoms cool. So they chose sexy people with condoms, right? They used marketing tactics. And so I named my podcast Drug Positive for the same reason. We need to speak positively first about why people choose to use drugs. And uh, then they listen to you <laughs> when you talk about the risks. And, but more than just listening to you about the risks, it just reorients their way of thinking using a drug intentionally for its positive benefits will make you less likely to overuse, take too much, or be self-destructive in your use. But if we continually send the message to young people that drugs are bad and you are being self-destructive when you use them, then you, we will manifest that behavior. So that happens even in the rave culture, with psychedelics even, and it, hap it really happens with addiction as well, which is why we say that addiction is a social culturally created uh, disease. All right, what else do you guys want me to talk about? Or any questions? Let's just open it up. How is it that you are not worried about prosecution? Is, is, can you explain that a little more for those of us who want to be more about it? So the main thing, because I am such a public figure advocating for the responsible use of drugs, I don't keep drugs at home. And I feel protected enough that way. But it's also not illegal to have been on a drug it's not illegal to be on a drug. I guess you can't be drunk in public or something like that, right? But, you know, it's not illegal. It's only illegal to have drugs on your possession. So if they made it illegal to admit that you had used a drug in the past, there'd be no treatment programs. There'd be no documentaries about drug use. Like, so, you know, there's, you know, talking openly about your drug use can be, for some of us, uh, fairly safe. What I like to say is coming out is a, always a personal choice. You have to worry about police. You have to worry about your people you know, maybe your boss, right? So you, there could be repercussions for coming out. 
If you're a person of color, that is an even more difficult choice to make, whether you want to come out or not. But uh, it is imperative that those of us who do feel safe enough coming out to do so, to do so publicly. This is one of the reasons that cannabis has become, is becoming legal everywhere. It's because even if you don't smoke yourself, you, everyone knows many people who do because at some point people became willing to, to come out of the closet. So, any, you had a question. One of the things this group wants to do is eventually do a decriminalize Salt Lake, decriminalize, and we've always kind of centered that around psychedelics, and you said all drugs, right? And I, I completely agree with you. In an area like this where people are much more conservative, um, how do you go about educating people so when you say we, we need to decriminalize all drugs, including heroin and cocaine and everything, how do you go do the pre-work to educate people so when they hear that, they don't instantly go like, just write you off as yep. a crazy person, right? Yeah, the first thing I do is get out of your head that you're gonna convince the conservative members of your community to decriminalize psychedelics because they're safer. The conservative members of your community are gonna look at you like you're a bunch of fucking weirdos and hippies for doing psychedelics. They, but they have compassion for people in their community who are struggling with addiction. So again, the reason to decriminalize drugs is to save people's lives. So I would suggest you first have to start going to needle exchange programs, going to the naloxone people, volunteering, and learning the language of harm reduction in the opioid community, because that's really what's going to drive the next step stage of our movement. You know, we, do, we are not advocating for heroin. We don't want heroin to be uh, publicly available for in 7-Elevens. Like, maybe we think that's how it should be ultimately for psychedelics. But even in the best case scenario, we don't want heroin to be available in convenience stores. There are greater risks. So Now, I would say that maybe there is some future route where if some adult wants to use opioids, they should be able to obtain opioids safely. I believe in the cognitive liberty aspect, but we can't legally regulate all drugs the same way. And that's a complicated question that the reform community is only beginning to talk about. How does every drug get legally regulated in the end? But Right now, what we need to do is decriminalize drugs so that we open the public space up and we can more easily provide services and help people who are using these drugs. So, does that answer your question? It's hard. It's a difficult, organizing is difficult. You know, you gotta shift your identity a little bit. You know, people wanna say, I'm a psychedelic, you're members of the Psychedelic Society. That's awesome, I'm a psychedelic user too. They changed my life, LSD changed my life. First drug brought love into my life. I've told my LSD story in the past. MDMA helped me love myself and forgive my father. These drugs are uh, lifesavers to many, many people and we're proud of that. We wanna identify uh, as such. Op opens up spiritual spirituality for people, right? But we can also add to our identity, I'm an activist. I don't want to see people going to jail. I want to end the prison industrial complex. I want to save lives. I believe that high-dose opioids may be an effective medication for people with severe childhood trauma. Bingo! That's what I was going to say. That's that, that, but when I was talking about the doctors using her heroin, <laughs> Um, the, the fact is that the high from heroin, the euphoria or inebriation, if you will, from taking high dose heroin only lasts about two weeks. It's like a side effect of the drug. And once you've been on it for a couple of weeks, you're just maintaining a state of normalcy. And people who use high dose opioids will all tell you that. To most of them, the euphoria is unwelcome. They just want the relief. And once they get past that, the drug is still having a beneficial effect of allowing them to live a life free of much of the anxiety that they were carrying with them. Anyway, it's like an antidepressant. It may be the best antidepressant that we have for severe trauma. And if it were legal and regulated, there would be no risk of overdose of adulterated drugs, of drugs spreading to other people, et cetera.
And one thing I learned in Maya's book here about this, this is very, very fascinating. It's about overdose and the difference between tolerance and sensitivity. When it comes to opioids, you want to develop a tolerance. So in methadone maintenance programs or when they give Suboxone to you or in the heroin maintenance programs in Switzerland, it's very, very important they tell the patients, you can take whatever dose you want, but you should come in at exactly the same time every day and take exactly the same dose when you do. Taking known doses regularly produces tolerance. Taking unknown doses at random times produces sensitivity. Sensitivity, however, is not just a linear relationship where a lower dose of the drug will make you feel higher. Sensitivity is a weird effect that involves a lot we don't understand and can't explain. For example, if you sensitize rats to heroin by giving them random doses at different times of the day, you can cause some of these rats to die by giving them the same dose as the other rats that you've also sensitized simply by putting them into a different color room. You put them from a green room into a red room or whatever, and they will die. There is something going on with sensitivity that increases your risk of overdose. You might die on a dose that's even lower than the last dose you took. The way that our receptors retreat and come out, it can be largely random, and it can be based on what's happening in your life right now. Did you have a fight with your spouse? Are you in a different location? And so what do we have going on in, this, in the world right now? We have a market that is highly adulterated where users have no idea the strength of what they're taking. We have them desperately clamoring to find their next fix, shooting up immediately in an alley or in a bathroom and in a completely different location. If we were trying to kill people who use opioids, we could not set up a better system than we have right now. But if you manage it well and take it every day, if you have educated doctors and nurses, high dose opioids may very well be an effective medication for people who otherwise can't cope. We might say they should do therapy, you know, they should move to Savannah and grieve over their divorce. Yeah, yeah, right, of course. But some people are not ready. Some people have trauma that's well beyond just being divorced by their person they love. And we should stop judging those people. All right, that's what I was going to say, but I'd forgotten. All right, <laughs> question, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, let me summarize that just for the sake of the online audience in case uh, they couldn't hear you through the mic. Um, what I heard you saying is that at least here in Salt Lake City, most of the people who are involved in re the reform movement, uh, whether it's cognitive liberty or harm reduction, drug reform movement, are people who have defected from the Mormon religion. And that's allowed them to sort of go against a lot of the strictures. Yeah, programming, which in, in, includes this um, naive notion that drug use is sinful and a moral failure, et cetera, right? And you, you all are loath to network with them, uh, again, because that's going to be difficult. I may not be the best person to ask that. I really don't know. This is my first time in Salt Lake City. Um, I was not raised religious. 
I went to graduate school in world religions because of my psychedelic use opened me up to spirituality, you know, and I like to look at myself as respecting all religions, but um, I, I have learned a lot about the weirdness of uh, Mormonism since I've been here talking to some of you guys, and it certainly appears to me to be a very uh, hierarchical, conservative social structure where tradition and the, the, all the judgments that go around around sex and, hedon, and hedonism and drug use, it's, that, that's going to be very hard. All, all, all I could say is, you know, if you can, you know, put a suit on and, you know, like, I can, I put a suit on, right? It works sometimes for some people, you know? <laughs> um, and, you know, pretend, I mean, you probably can't do that. But if you find someone who's still a devout Mormon that you can you know, give these books to and convince them of the need, you know, uh, compassion is a very powerful force as well. It's not, you know, uh, shame may be a little bigger, but when you get people to start feeling compassionate and you can explain the logic to them about why this is going to save lives and why it's not encouraging drug use, again, it's not the cognitive liberty argument. It's not about increasing access to heroin. It's about actually reducing access. If you explain how Switzerland has shrunk their heroin market uh, by removing uh, all the addicted people from that market and how that's also help those people get back on their feet, how it's reduced crime, fewer muggings, fewer robberies, maybe some of them can get over it, uh, get over their, you know, um, naivety, but you guys have an uphill battle. All right, any other questions, or what do you guys, what do you want me to talk about? How much time we got? I'm willing to talk as long as you want me to. I love to talk, if you haven't <laughs> figured that out yet. That can be positive and negative, but because you invited me here with the mic up front, I think you all, it's positive, so I can say, I want to talk. What? <laughs> uh, I was kind of curious about, you mentioned that uh, the vast majority of drug users in, in any drug test aren't problematic drug users. Yep. Uh, what do we know about, about what criteria, what makes the difference? Is it, is it someone's intent? Is it biology? Is it some mix? That, Yeah, well, we talked a little bit about it a minute ago. Uh, the main, the greatest factor in developing a uh, substance use disorder is, ch is childhood trauma. The more severe the trauma, the more likely uh, you are to develop it with certain drugs. Um, epigenetics plays a role. Uh, we know that stress response is heavily influenced and passed down. You know, if your grandparents were, suffered a lot of stress, you could have a heightened stress response. So some people are just born with that. Uh, but mostly I want to go back to what Maya says in her book, The Unbroken Brain. It's a learning disorder, and it generally develops in adolescence. For example, if you tell your kids that they're bad, if you had less capable parents and they constantly told you, you're bad, you're going to come amount to nothing, you're no good, blah, 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 right? And, you know, say that's combined also with heightened stress response or maybe ADHD, so your teachers are telling you that you can't learn well or, you know, whatever random uh, factors. Like, you can develop a mindset where you think you're bad, you judge yourself, and then if by chance you happen to be in a situation where someone gives you some cocaine or some heroin or some drug, and you get in your head when you do that, that this will make me confident, this will make me feel better. You, you are teaching yourself, you're mind fucking yourself that this drug fixes me. The fix, the whole language, get your fix. If you don't believe that a drug fixes you, you will never become addicted to that drug. The chemical hooks coexist with your mental interpretation of what that drug is doing for you. That's why I call it a mindfuck. You know, having worked in the drug scene for so long, there is not a single drug out there that, oh, I was just thinking there's probably a couple exceptions to this, but I'll say it anyway. There, uh, the vast, you pick a drug and I can almost guarantee you that someone out there thinks it's an aphrodisiac, <laughs> right? I mean, obviously, that's easy with the dopamine drugs, you know, the reinforcement, cocaine, meth. Uh, but some people think alcohol is, makes them feel sexy. Some people, cannabis, you know, oh, yeah, it's a what, What's going on here? A lot, these drugs all act on different receptors. They do completely different things, and not everybody agrees with everyone's statement in that regard, right? It's because some people have convinced themselves. 
So there's a, something Mai describes as sequencing, that the way that our brains form as a child growing up through a very small incident can take a route that has a dramatic consequence. It's like that proverbial butterfly flaps its wings and uh, sometimes that might do nothing, but other times that could cause a hurricane in another part of the world, right? Chaos theory is the same thing. There are kind of inexplicable ways why some people can more easily develop problems with drugs than others, but generally, to sum up, uh, trauma, parenting, self-esteem, and how drugs are presented to us in society. So um, I hope that answered your question. You know, it's... That's certainly one part of it. What would you describe the healthy approach to? I mean, you mentioned that uh, if you feel like drugs are going to fix you, you'll become addicted to them. But people do drugs for a reason, right? Like, yeah. Why do people do drugs? And what are, what are the, what's the, um, the healthy approach to the healthy concept? Why, all right. What, why do you, the question was, what's the healthier approach to drug use? So let me ask you, why do you use drugs? Um, I think... For insight, for therapy, for de self-development, right? Not as a crutch, right? Because let's face it, you can't do psychedelics every day. It's not going to. Oh, uh huh. I mean, it feels sort of like I'm fixing myself, right? Yeah, that that that's true. Uh, but take no ketamine is also the only addictive psychedelic in that regard, right? Yeah, people and people can get into trouble with it. So um, be careful, you know. But. Is anyone here willing to talk about their use of non-psychedelics and why they might use cocaine or Adderall or an opioid? Go, ahead. Go you. You haven't talked. Or, yeah, you both have, So, but you first. Okay, good. <laughs> well, it's simple, but when I went to the ER in December and they gave me Percocet, I used it as a painkiller. Well, okay, I'm, let me rephrase that question. What I mean is yeah. that I wasn't nervous about getting addicted yeah. because I wasn't using it to fix my life. I was right. using it in a way that just helped me manage pain. Right, okay, using it for a me legitimate medical reason. Let me rephrase the question. Who's used any of these substances recreationally, and why did you choose to do that? Go ahead. Uh, I think opioids make me more sociable. More social. Reduce anxiety. Just, I don't know, that yeah, right. That's one good reason. So people talk about medical marijuana, right? But nobody talks about medical alcohol, right? But if you ask me, the, there are these, these blurry lines between medical use and, and, and using a substance for stress relief, right? Which we all do with alcohol and cannabis. You know, when I do cannabis, I like to do it when I've done another psychedelic and I like to watch uh, fractal zoom videos. I, I use it to, because of their, the psychedelic effects, not so much to relax. But yeah, that's one reason, to relax, to be social. And uh, that's a legitimate use. You know, I'll say why I use cocaine. I use cocaine because it's fun and it makes me talk even faster than I talk, <laughs> makes me make people laugh when I talk to them. Maybe it even helps me listen more, you know? Like, there's strange social bonding that takes place on stimulants. Maybe not quite as intense as MDMA, but MDMA is a dopamine releaser too. It's got the mostly serotonin, you know? Cocaine is a dopamine reuptake inhibitor. It's going to increase monoamines, you increase alertness, you increase confidence, you know? Some people can become assholes on stimulants, you know, but some people become assholes on alcohol, even way more than that. People use drugs for various reasons non-medically, and uh, there are benefits. Most people don't develop problems with their drug use again. So. Yes? Yeah, I have a question about your Okay, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, I wouldn't say it was especially bad. I would say I was shocked at what I saw when I went there. Because, you know, I, I've often wondered whether I was slightly on the Asperger spectrum when I was a kid, and maybe all of my early MDMA use starting in 1986 when I was a teenager kind of 
helped me overcome some of that stilted kind of autistic spectrum stuff. But to get to the point, so I, when I did drugs, I went to the library first and I read everything about them, studied them, found out every piece of information and devoured it. And you know, when I, LSD was my first drug and I did it right. I got a small group of friends. I went out to the forest. We, you know, we made sure we weren't anywhere where we could get bad news. You know, we just, I followed the rules that our mentors, our, our, elders uh, taught us, uh, Timothy Leary and Huxley and Ginsburg and whatnot, you know. And I don't know, I just thought that <laughs> when I started Dance Safe, when I found out that the market had become adulterated and the Dutch government had a testing kit, and I, that uh, the Dutch are like, they lead the world in harm reduction, right? They had needle exchange in 1983 before we even acknowledged that AIDS was a thing. And, uh, and so they started, they, they had pill testing with the uh, marquee reagent. And I just, when I said, oh, I'm going to do that here. I thought that I was going out to like help people who were really, you know, like me, you know, wanting to find MDMA, you know, and uh, uh, call me naive or whatever, but I had never really been in a drug, like one of the first things I saw was this, and these were all ages events too. The massives in Oakland were like five to 10,000 people all ages events and there were teenagers like 14 year olds going around i saw this girl with a little spoon and she was dipping into a little bottle and she was saying bump a k bump a k bump a k and these obviously high people other teenagers were just snorting this mystery powder off of a spoon from somebody i didn't even know what ketamine was at that time i'm like what's k i'm asking the volunteers what the heck is k you know but the idea that someone would just snort a drug off a spoon from a complete stranger was shocking to me and i will never forget that image and i was like oh my god we have to begin with education 101 the other experience i had is i started talking to these young people and finding out what do you know and i remember this is shock this is a fun story you guys are gonna love this I'm responsible for the name Molly, and I will tell you why. This is a long story, <laughs> but it's a fun one. So when I first went to Raves in the Bay Area back in 1999, I started asking young people, so what's ecstasy? What, what is ecstasy? They looked at me like I was their father. They were like, what do you mean what's ecstasy? Ecstasies are these little pills that you buy here at the raves and some of them make you feel good and some of them make you feel bad. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> That's ecstasy. So what, what drugs are in them? And they would just list off the drugs they know. Oh, meth, cocaine, heroin. The majority of these the younger people, because you know, the age, there was a mixed ages, but the younger people, they didn't even, they had never heard of MDMA. They thought that the, these little pills contained a combination of drugs. Some would make you feel good, some would make you feel bad. The ones that make you feel felt good were so amazing, they would fork out $20 and get a bunk pill two or three times, and they would keep coming back to try to get that one that actually contained MDMA, right? So we had to begin literally with Education 101. And I produced a pamphlet, and we trained all of our chapters to explain to people that MDMA is its own molecule. And you don't get good ecstasy or bad ecstasy. You're getting real ecstasy or fake ecstasy. You're getting pills that actually contain the real molecule that you're looking for, or you're getting pills that contain a different drug. And in a sense, what we were trying to do is rehabilitate the name ecstasy, which now I'm totally against because it backfired, and I'll explain why. Don't ever use slang names for anything. Don't call MDA SAS. Don't even use Moxie or Foxy. Use the chemical names only. And the reason is because slang names will always become, they will always de-educate people. But, you know, MDMA had been synonymous with ecstasy for about 10 years. Supposedly, they tried empathy, which would have been a better term for it, but uh, nobody knew what that meant. Uh, ec <laughs> ecstasy sold better, right? But for that, those 10 years, from 85 when the DA banned it to 95, if you bought something that was called ecstasy, you were getting pure MDMA. The market did not become adulterated until about 1995. And then it rapidly became adulterated, or I should say 
counterfeit pills. Because when we think of adulteration, we think of, okay, there's MDMA in it, but then there's something else. But usually what it was is completely fake pills and PMA, paramethoxyamphetamine, started killing people in approximately 1995. Because at the time, most of the ecstasy tablets were being manufactured in Eastern Europe. And they were being imported into the United States with the assistance of Mossad, the Israeli secret service. And we could tell, I mean, in fact, through our lab program, where the pills entered the country because they would, someone would send it to the lab and then we'd see them go across. And, and by the time I started Dance Safe in 98 and started going to raves in 99, the majority of tablets were counterfeit and ecstasy had become known as just these little pills that contain different drugs, right? And you hope that you get the right one. But if you happen to get crystal or powder, that was almost assuredly being manufactured in North America by psychedelic chemists with more scruples. The reason Eastern Europe became a hub at that time, by the way, for ecstasy production was because of the fall of the Soviet Union. When all of these countries like Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, et cetera, got cut off from their funding source and they needed to make, uh, find a way to make hard currency. So MDMA had just become illegal like five years earlier and they decided to manufacture and sell MDMA to the West. This is also the reason that the iconic ecstasy tablet back in the 90s, the, the, the logo, the imprint of the most famous ecstasy, who knows what it was? The Mitsubishi logo. I always wondered why it is that ecstasy tablet contained corporate logos. Adidas, you know, Atari, Mitsubishi, like, LSD blotter art never had corporate logos on them, right? <laughs> and the reason when I, you know, I, when I learned and I started getting involved in this movement and talking to people is because these early tablets were being pressed and manufactured by Eastern Europeans who had lived their whole lives behind the Iron Curtain and they knew nothing about Western culture with the exception of the Western corporation, the cars that, were, that made it into their country. <laughs> and so, what, can you imagine these dudes with mustaches? What if we put on these pills? Oh, I don't know. Put the symbols of their culture on these pills, right? <laughs> and then that 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 pattern goes on has has gone on even today. You have a Twitter tablets. If you look at what's being produced in. Uh, Europe now, mostly the Netherlands, a lot of these pills are coming from, they still are using <laughs> corporate logos. Uh, thank God LSD artists are not doing that with blotter. That would really suck. <laughs> anyway, going back, um, if at the time in the late 90s you happened to find powder, not a pressed tablet, most likely it was being made by a chemist in the United States, and most likely it was pure because these were not gigantic uh, government sanctioned criminal organizations trying to make millions, billions of dollars, right? These, uh, these were like, like I'm sure they were trying to make money, but they were also trying to spread the love. And because Dance Safe had put out a pamphlet saying, uh, right at the beginning, and we instructed all of our chapters to, to help young people distinguish between, um, you, you know, to understand that MDMA is its own molecule, in 2000, people started calling powder MDMA molecule and molecule over the course of the years got shortened to molly and so I've got no proof of this but I'm <laughs> sure that it was from the dance safe pamphlet at the time man I got so many of these early stories that are really really funny uh, anyone else yeah uh, what are your thoughts on uh, medicalization Oh, God, you just asked the most controversial question going on in the movement right now. Uh, the question was, what do I think about the medicalization of psychedelics uh, without decriminalization? You know, so there are a lot of people that have become very critical of the mainstreaming, especially the for-profit mainstreaming of, of psychedelics. And um, 
I'm with them to a large degree as well. I don't think Compass Pathways, who's going to try to make money selling psilocybin therapy sessions, is going to support the decriminalization of psilocybin. They may even, as capitalists do, like the alcohol industry, start supporting a crackdown on psilocybin. Can we put this past Peter Thiel? We all know who he is, right? Who's, you know, is he the founder? He's part of Compass Pathways. So, like, uh, there's a lot that I agree with. The strategy from MAPS in the early days, you know, beginning 30 years ago, was to bring MDMA through the FDA system and legalize it medically. But that wasn't ever Rick's only desire. That was seen as a first step to soften public opinion, after which legal regulation would be the next step. And Rick just told me a few weeks ago he thinks 35 years from now. You know, he's speculating on when that might happen, right? But I just interviewed Brian Pace. I'll be releasing a podcast soon. He wrote this article recently, maybe some of you read it, um, called I think, Rise of the Psychedelic Nazis. Did anyone see that article? Oh, uh, Google psychedelic Nazis and read Brian Pace's article. He's very, very critical of, of what's happening. And actually, his main thesis is that there's nothing inherent in psychedelics that makes people more liberal or open-minded. And probably he's right. Uh, universally, psychedelics make people more creative, but I don't think it's going to make you into an anti-fascist. And he, or even, you know, like, I think there's some way in which we know that well, I don't even know if that, that, so there are some studies that show that people who have taken psychedelics, the one trait that kind of have more than most others is this trait that's called openness to new experience. It's one of the big five personality traits that Cambridge Analytica used to analyze us all and help Trump get elected, right? But openness to experience seems to be correlated with taking psychedelics, but correlation is not causation. I think that people who are willing to break the law, people who are willing to do a mind-altering drug are clearly people who are going to be open to new experiences, right? So in his article, he cites a lot of cases of right-wingers, even, even outright fascists who are using, producing psychedelics. And then he also talks about the for-profit uh, companies who are, and not, not even just like the Peter Thiel ultra-capitalist corporations, but a lot of the new groups who are hoping to get in on the game of psychedelic therapy or integration sessions for money or encounter group trips to Mexico to do ayahuasca or whatever that they, I think he's got a good critique. Some of them rightfully will exaggerate the benefits just like the wellness industry does with anything they can make money on pathologize even more than necessary the ailments that psychedelics could be helpful for. Capitalism tends to corrupt and pervert a lot of things. So I agree with that critique, but kind of where I'm not as alarmed about it, and I'm going to do a podcast about it. I'm going to write a monologue beforehand like I do where, where you'll hear my carefully constructed beliefs on this. But I'm less concerned about it because I just don't think any of that's going to stop underground psychedelic movement. You know, I think that our, our community is big enough and strong enough and let, 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 let capitalism do its thing, right? We, we can't stop it, we let, but let's keep criticizing it, of course. I'm a big critic of the way capitalism has perverted Hinduism and yoga, for example, right? Yoga has had never had anything to do with stretching and postures, yoga was from the word yoke to unite, Atman with Brahman, and it was meditation practices. In Patanjali, there was only one pose you were supposed to use in your practice, and it was about you know, meditation, right? But why, you know, I could go off writing articles on how capitalism has destroyed yoga, but millions of people like and they do yoga and you know, let them do yoga, right? So there's gonna be people paying $1,000 to go on their mushroom retreat in South America, let them do that, right? We will keep using these drugs with our friends at music festivals, having a great time and, and enjoying ourselves and healing and all of the great things that come from the non-official, free, celebratory use of these substances. So I'm not too worried about that, even though I share the critique of capitalism. So. Yeah. So I'm, I'm more interested in your dancing uh, early days of movement, but um, did you find 
that there were certain places that brought a, little, a lot more to law enforcement need or pressure from local communities to stay out because uh, like we talked about a little bit earlier, uh, you know, you have that, that head in the sand, what you talked about, you know, if they just deny that any festivals are having drug use, they don't need to, to let them in. Yeah, <laughs> so... Um, he was asking if there were places in the country in the early days that were more resistant to allowing Dan Safe in. Um, and the answer is yes. But I'll just give you a brief history of how this all went down. It's, uh, I told some of you this story last night, but um, I'll tell it again because it's super fun. Like, so in the early days, we managed to secure amnesty agreements from local police in most of the cities where Dan Safe operated. And the promoters for the most part, allowed us in because they realized the last thing that they wanted was someone to die at their event, right? Then the federal government, the DEA, launched what I call the last great government-funded anti-drug propaganda campaign against, you guessed it, ecstasy. They pumped millions of dollars. They sent press releases to all the newspapers and magazines and the TV shows around the country. New demon drug. It's going to create a generation of brain-damaged youth. They funded bogus studies by unscrupulous researchers to claim falsely that MDMA produced Parkinson's disease, etc. They did that during the buildup. It was a long, planned-out campaign. And they launched their campaign right after Dance Save formed. Or coincidentally, I formed Dance Save just before this campaign got launched. You got to remember, the drug war at the time was falling out of favor because Gary Webb, uh, the San Jose Mercury news reporter, had just published his expose implicating the CIA and the DEA in spreading crack cocaine in black communities in this country, betraying the trust of you know, millions of people. And the DEA was trying to sort of upgrade their reputation. So they were going to scare middle America. There's this new demon drug that's going to bring damage to your children, and we're going to stomp it out. They wanted the Congress to give them millions of dollars to open up these demand reduction centers around the country. And they got that money, and those centers are still out there. But their anti-ecstasy campaign was going to be how they were going to do it. So one day, I get a call from... 60 Minutes and Dateline on the same day, wanting to do stories on Dance Safe. I was like, oh my God, what's, what's going on here? I had my little Bay Area chapter, right? And uh, 60 Minutes called first, and I was like, well, why are you want to do a story on us? Oh, we found you online. We like what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. And I was a little, you know, nervous because, you know, this is the, the corporate media. They're going to do a hit piece against us. I, so I have to think about this. And then an hour later, I get a call from 20, I mean, from uh, Dateline. Do you know these shows, 60 Minutes and Dateline? Is Dateline still around? Like, <laughs> and they also wanted to do a story on us. And I said, where are you kidding? 60 Minutes just called me. They want to do a story on us too. What's going on here? And the producer was like, no, 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 you can't do 60 Minutes. You just, you have to do us, only us. I'm like, why, why is that? No, I'm sorry, you can't, you can't. I said, I have to call you back. And I call up 60 Minutes. Hey, you know, Dateline just called me and they want to do a story on us too. What's this about? No, no, you can't do Dateline. You just have to do us. I need to call you back. I call Rick Doblin, who was my main advisor at the time. What's going on, Rick? Oh, you don't know. The DEA just launched their anti-ecstasy campaign. And what was really going on, they were vying to be the first TV news magazine to break the new demon drug story. And it was very clear in the DEA press release that they were associating MDMA with raves. They wanted to shut down the rave culture. They saw these parties as just drug havens, drug dens, and they needed to get footage of the drug at a rave. And of course, no promoter would touch him with a 10-foot pole. But here's this group, Dance Save. They actually test drugs at a rave. Perfect. Here's a way we can get footage of the drug in a rave, right? And I was like, oh, shit. Rick, should I do this? And I wasn't going to do it at all, but Rick said, you know, even negative media for harm reduction in this climate is positive media. And he encouraged me to do it. And I said, okay. So I picked 60 minutes. Uh, people told me they were less sensationalistic than Dateline. 
And um, the producer, you know, she came out and visited our national office a few times, and then like a couple weeks later, they flew out the talking head, the, the interviewer who, uh, and the film crew, and her name was Vicki Mabry, and they powdered my face, and, and I was really nervous. And the producer saw that I was nervous and comes up to me and whispers in my ear, don't worry, I've taken ecstasy, and I think what you're doing is great. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went and was interviewed, and all this talking head woman did was ask me, you know, in 15 different ways, aren't you just promoting drug use? What do you say to parents who say to you, you're just promoting drug use? And I learned enough PR to know, never repeat your opponent's argument, even to deny it. So if I had said, no, we're not promoting drug use, we, oh, they would just, that's all they would use, me denying it. So instead I would say, the drug war is killing children. Where are these parents you're talking about? We work with parents whose kids died from fake ecstasy. They're doing a press release with us really soon. And I just kept putting it back, staying on message, right? I didn't give them any ammunition to use against us. Well, when the episode came out and 60 Minutes did beat Dateline to the punch, what, what Dateline did, by the way, is they, they put a hidden camera on a 16-year-old girl, sent her into a rave, having her solicit ecstasy from as many people as possible, and then edited it to make it look like people were just coming up and offering her drugs. So they really were more sensationalistic. Uh, so, but in any case, the 60-minute show came out first, and it was, your tw it was a 12-minute show, and it was your typical demon drug show with the DEA talking about brain damage and everything else. But in the middle, there is a three-minute segment on DanceSafe, and they totally did us justice. This producer, Wendy, somehow managed to be authentic and truthful. And that opened up the floodgates. I was on MTV, uh, 2020, Geraldo, the Jim Lair Hour, uh, 48 Hours. Uh, I was in Time, Newsweek, and, and it was all positive. All of it was pro-harm reduction. We fucking rained on the DEA's parade, and it <laughs> pissed them off. One interesting thing that happened, they got so pissed off, and even Oprah was about to do a positive show on MDMA. I was going to be on, Rick Doblin was going to be on. They were going to do a therapy show, they were going to do a harm reduction show, Oprah fucking Winfrey. Two weeks before we're set to go on Oprah, the producer calls us and says, they pulled me off the show. I'm sorry, they're gonna, they're gonna take a different route. And when the show, when the show came, came out, they had this 16 year old girl who claimed that she had done a bunch of ecstasy with, uh, and her radiologist showing this three dimensional image of her brain with golf ball size holes in it saying, see this, you have holes in your brain because of the ecstasy that you used. What they did is it was a blood flow uh, scan where they turned up the contrast so the areas of lower blood flow just disappeared and looked like there were holes in it. Totally ridiculous, bogus lie. <laughs> and uh, it totally backfired on them. Like, totally backfired, and the two main reasons, other than the fact that DanceSafe had gotten itself into like so many of, like six months worth of positive media beforehand, but it also backfired because the internet had been out for five years now, and it was so easy for anyone to just find, to, find, to learn the truth about illegal drugs, but maybe none of you in here are old enough to remember the days before the internet when all news about drugs came from the same handful of corporate news channels. And the DEA, who were all these you know, old fogies, boomers, or what was the generation before them even, like thought that they, were, they didn't realize the times they were living. And that's why I call it the last great government-funded anti-drug propaganda campaign because they've never been able to do it. They've never attempted such ridiculousness since. Holes in your brain, right? So, I called, I found this woman, because I was like, just pissed off that they were lying to this, uh, this teenager. I found her number and I called her and said, you know, I just want you to know you really don't have holes in your brain. Like, if you did, you wouldn't be alive. Like, or you, you wouldn't be able to speak. You'd be in a coma, like golf ball size holes in your brain. She's like, oh, I know, but I'm having such a good time going on TV. 
I was like, oh, okay, right? So <laughs> cut now to like, you know, 20 years later, I'm making my documentary on MDMA, and a few years ago, I decided, let me call her up. Let me see what she thinks now. You know, maybe I'll, I mean, we're definitely going to put this story in the movie. You know, you have to put the last great government-funded anti-drug propaganda campaign story in the documentary. Let's see what she says. But I looked her up. She's made a career being an anti-drug uh, poster child. She wrote a book called Rolling Away, My Agony with Ecstasy. <laughs> and so I emailed her. She never emailed me back. I'm thinking, okay, she's, you know, maybe a narcissist or she's clearly not an authentic, truthful person, right? So, but that's a funny story. So then what happened is that the DEA got Joe Biden to pass the RAVE Act. Joe Biden was the author and sponsor of the Reducing Americans' Vulnerability to Ecstasy Act. Uh, it actually failed the first year because it was so clearly directed at the subculture rather than any criminal activity. That they called it the RAVE Act, and they had in the bill findings instructing authorities on how they can know what a rave actually is so that they know which ones to go after. And they were saying things like if the beats per music was a certain amount, and if there were glow sticks and pacifiers, that was a sign that this is a rave, right? And so like it was so clearly criminalizing a music culture uh, that it failed. And so then they changed the name to the Illicit Drug Anti-Proliferation Act, and they passed it in 2003, a year later, tacked on as a rider to the Amber Alert Bill. Now, the Amber Alert Bill is, you know, about protecting children who have disappeared, potentially kidnapped, etc. So they tacked it on there, and it would be really hard, right, to vote against the Amber Alert Bill. So uh, they removed all the rave stipulations, and then they, they passed it in 2003 with a different name, but we still call it the Rave Act because it's essentially the same thing. And, that's, and it was essentially an expansion of the crack house laws. The crack house laws in the 80s said that uh, if you are renting an apartment and your tenants are using drugs, then we can go after you. You can be criminally prosecuted. We can seize all your assets, et cetera. There are plenty of constitutional violations around that. And they tried to use that against some promoters in the late 90s, early 2000s, they failed. Disco Donnie was a New Orleans promoter. I think he's still a part of SFX. Some of these guys that were, that were attacked back then by the DEA went on and continued and are now a part of, of these billion dollar festival corporations right now. And they still have a chill down their spine and some of them won't allow Dance Safe back in. But it's kind of understandable because you know, they almost went to prison and lost everything. That, you know, so you know, we like to say times are different now and uh, most of the festivals we go in, we test openly. Uh, even the local law enforcement, we test for them. Everything is, is out in the open. The vast majority, we have 250 festivals a year. We don't test at all of them, but we test at a lot of them. But some of the really big ones, um, they won't let us in because they're afraid of the Rave Act. Um, so again, sometimes laws just fade away. And with the fentanyl crisis now, drug checking is becoming much more widely accepted. So um, we're getting allowed in to test to more and more events every year. But that's kind of the story of how, of the history of, uh, before the feds cracked down, it, it, we got lots of cooperation and then it, sh you know, tightened up and now it's opening up again. Culture is changing. Yeah. We know of no confirmed case of a fentanyl contaminating MDMA or ketamine. We have confirmed cases of fentanyl contaminating methamphetamine. Mostly though, it's in the opioid supply and the cocaine supply. But um, unfortunately, I think we're only in the beginnings of the fentanyl crisis. Every year since 2013, fatalities have increased and are gonna keep increasing. And so, uh, I would suggest testing your MDMA as well. Yeah. Uh, what's your thoughts on our government's... Oh, uh, question is, w w what are my thoughts on the possible participation by our own government 
in the adulteration of drugs. So it's not without precedent. During alcohol prohibition, some alcohol was poisoned and did lead to people dying, becoming blind, trying to scare people away from consuming illicit alcohol. Whether or not rogue elements of the DEA are involved in the fentanyl crisis right now, there's no evidence for that. But what we can say is uh, government doesn't really care about people who use drugs. So for example, the state crime labs in Ohio, which is the epicenter of the fentanyl crisis, knew for two years that thousands of people were dying from fentanyl-laced cocaine, and they did not tell the public. And it took Dennis Cushon, the founder of Harm Reduction Ohio, to threaten them with a Freedom of Information Act request to get them to finally, two years later, tell the public that, yes, there's fentanyl and cocaine. And um, you, know, you can be a conspiracy theorist if you want, and I think some conspiracies are real, you know, but more importantly, it just goes back to stigma. You know, when you think that you're uh, immoral because you're using cocaine, why are, is anyone really gonna, gonna care about you, you know? Are they actually devoting, is law enforcement devoting their time to tracking down specifically the people who are putting fentanyl into cocaine? I don't know. What I do know, though, is that it's taken over, whereas it probably began with mid-level dealers in the United States buying fentanyl off the dark net. Uh, the cartels now are absolutely selling fentanyl and heroin's going away. Most of the heroin in the U.S. is coming from Mexico, like over the last decade. Most of the heroin in Europe comes from Afghanistan. And the Mexican cartels have definitely shifted towards fentanyl. So, again, it's much more powerful, takes up much less space. It's here to stay, iron law prohibition. Until we end it, uh, it's just gonna get worse. You and then you. Yes, yes. There are some countries where it's starting to become more of a problem, but it's vastly less of a problem in Europe so far. But I think ultimately it's gonna go that direction even in Europe, yeah. So, you know, there is some speculation. Uh, a lot of the uh, podcast world has been claiming that China is intentionally trying to poison America to get back at the West for maybe the opium wars centuries ago, right? Um, I don't think that's the case. I think the labs in China are making a lot of money. They're abiding by the laws of China, and China has been very slow to ban fentanyl and its precursors, and uh, there are still fentanyl precursors. So first you buy fentanyl, your, your cartel in Mexico, you're just buying fentanyl and, pack, and you know, bulking it up and selling it to the West, and then China bans fentanyl, okay, and then now there's fentanyl precursors, direct precursors, and then a year or two later they'll ban those. But there's always new precursors and fentanyl analogs and precursors to the fentanyl analogs. So even to this day, the cartels are still legally buying these drugs from above ground companies who are obeying the all Chinese laws and fentanyl is still flooding the United States. So why isn't China even more cracking down on banning these analogs? And I think the reason is just uh, regular old corruption. They're making shitloads of money. They're getting kickbacks from the companies that are selling it, et cetera. That's really what I think. Because I, what does China stand in killing you know, tens of thousands of Americans, like, it doesn't weaken the U.S. imperial government to do that, you know. Um, in, in fact, the, the real conspiracy around the international drug trade is that the United States has historically long used drug profits to fund their dirty wars against socialist communist countries around the world. Uh, going back to Chiang Kai-shek, who funded his entire army and the nationalist ch uh, Chinese general from selling opium and heroin. And, uh, you know, al allowing the Contras to sell crack, cocaine, and make money, and, you, you know, like, this, is, this goes on and on. On and on. So um, using drug profits as a funding source for covert 
armies to fight proxy wars on behalf of U.S. corporations is a main reason that drugs are kept illegal, along with the fact that most drug profits are laundered through Western corporations, propping up the value of the dollar and preventing those billions of dollars a year from going to China or Russia, right? The way these cynical CIA people think about it is, if we didn't make the profits from drugs, Russia and China would. So we're going to keep them illegal and keep the profits flowing. That's the elephant in the living room. That's the hardest. That's the real reason it's going to be difficult to get certain drugs like heroin and cocaine legally regulated because it would strip those profits away. It would eliminate the excuse used for covert uh, military operations. But I think we can still get psychedelics legally regulated at some point in the future because those drugs, including cannabis for a different reason, can't be monopolized. Cannabis can't be monopolized because it grows everywhere. It's a weed and a single plant can have enough cannabis for your entire family. Psychedelics can be produced with chemicals in a small laboratory anywhere. Right? You can't really monopolize. But for cocaine and heroin, you need fields and fields of plants. You need protection. You need state protection in order to produce these things. U.S. military is in Afghanistan protecting the poppy fields. You know, in 2000, this is very interesting. In 2000, I went to the Harm Reduction Coalition Conference in Miami. And the talk of the conference was that heroin addicts were people with problematic opioid use, were checking themselves into rehab in droves across the United States. Back then, the Mexican cartels hadn't gotten into the heroin trade yet, so most of the heroin entering the US was coming from Afghanistan, like Europe. But in 2000, there was hardly any heroin to be found, no opioids to be found. Fentanyl hasn't around then. Does anyone, can anyone guess why in 2000 there was no heroin on the streets of the United States? No, the Taliban had banned it. The Taliban had successfully banned opioid production. What happens the next year? We have 9-11, and the United States invades Afghanistan, and in 2002, there is a record a crop of opium, and every year since, there has been an increase in the amount of heroin flooding into Europe, but then the Mexican cartels started producing the heroin for the United States. So that should give you an inkling of this elephant in the living room and what nobody's really talking about and the difficulties. But maybe we can get these drugs at least decriminalized, maybe not legalized. Might be hard to get massive heroin maintenance programs because if you were to eliminate uh, all of the black market heroin, then you would eliminate the profits and the covert uh, benefits of uh, drugs and militarization. All right, how's that for conspiracy theory for you? Was I convincing or do I sound like a nut job? <laughs> you can believe it if you want. There's a lot of pictures of U.S. military with their guns walking through the poppy fields of Afghanistan. You can find these photos online. I talked to some, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah. How are we on time? 4.15, okay, someone check. Someone check, did Bernie win Nevada? <laughs> oh no, the, uh, the Google Docs uh, failed that they were using to report the results. Huh? Is that what they're really saying? They're not going to have the results till tomorrow? Well, they were saying, like, it's a fairly simple technology. There are like, a lot of, like, uh, uh -huh. um, people in charge of the process are, like, older, so generally they have problems with technology. <laughs> uh huh, okay. Back in Iowa, I'm a big Bernie fan. Go Bernie. Take over the Democratic Party. Kick out the billionaires. All right. Uh, should I keep talking? Do we have more? Like, it's up to you guys. Question here? Yeah. So what, what would your recommendation be for us in this community to, to kind of help the harm reduction movement here? I mean, we, we talked a little bit about you know, a lot of the concerts and
What? Why would they ban they banned light up gear at the concert? Why? Because they're associated with Oh my god, you guys really are backwards. They're still they're still using the 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 findings of the original Rave Act law, huh? <laughs> uh-huh. Everybody off guard. Like, what do you mean we can't get like, Oh, that yeah. All right. Home audience, in case you didn't hear the question, is just kind of what can we do here to advance harm reduction because we live in such a ass backwards state that's still banning uh, glow sticks uh, from events. Um, you know, I don't know. I'm going to have to plead the fifth on this. I don't know. Uh, you know, if it, I'm getting really depressed being here. I'm sort of half expecting police to bust in here and arrest me now, you know. <laughs> Like, um, you know, it, slow and hard work, you know? Like, you know, I, I remember, here's what I would say. Do something that makes you feel uncomfortable. Just do it. Like, you're, we're not going to, we're not gonna stop the fascist takeover of this country if we don't do things that make us uncomfortable. But I'll give you a, a less, uh, devastating example or you know less serious example when I started dance safe I decided early on to call and approach the parents of everyone that I found out through the media who died from fake ecstasy and um, you know other people around me said oh you're crazy those people are going to be the most anti-drug people et cetera, et cetera. you know and I was uncomfortable what do you say you know, to someone who's lost to their child. But I did it. I also approached police. I approached police and told them what we were doing, you know. And uh, for the most part, I was surprised and met with support. I think more people than you think probably understand and agree with harm reduction, even your conservative uh, Mormon re devout religious people. You're not saying drugs are great. You're saying we need to educate young people because people are dying. You know, we need to provide services as people are dying, right? So you just might have the same kind of fears that I had when I started Dance Safe, and you just might be surprised if you, if you start it. Um, I used to tell chapters, I gave them some advice. Assume your potential adversaries are allies. When you approach them, have in your mind and heart this belief that, of course, they're going to agree with you. Because if you go in there thinking they're not going to agree with you, it's going to come across in your voice. It's going to come across in your posture. And they're going to immediately think, oh, who's this guy, you know, blah, blah, blah. But if you really believe they're going to support you and you come up with confidence, we have a crisis and we need to fix this, and, you know, you, will, you might be surprised. The other one is better ask forgiveness than permission. Start doing it because... Uh, you know, if you're willing to risk potentially getting arrested. I mean, I would start just not with the, te the testing, just with the literature, you know. Start a dance safe chapter and just do literature. Try to work your way in. Go in the parking lot and hand out literature. Do it. Do what you need to do to protect the lives of the people in your community, the, the people who are going to the music events that you like, your community. Just get out there and do it. Because if you ask permission, nobody wants to take responsibility. But if you force them to shut you down after you've started it, Nobody wants to take responsibility. It's, it's human nature. So we, never, we didn't go to the police and ask permission. We approached the police after we were doing it and let them know what we were doing. Better than letting them find you first, you know, tell them what you're doing, right? So that's, uh, that's my advice. Do something uncomfortable and um, let go of your fear. You might be surprised. Thank you.